In the afternoon and evening of March 31st, 2023, as well as the early morning hours of April 1st, 147 tornadoes wreaked havoc from Alabama to Illinois. This would become the third worst outbreak in meteorological history in terms of tornadoes produced during a 24-hour period, eclipsed only by the infamous 1974 and 2011 super outbreaks. The event is also well known for being the first double high risk issued by the Storm Prediction Center in 11 years, and the first high risk since March 25th, 2021. In this video, we'll break down the bimodal setup in the Upper Plains and South and analyze a handful of the tornadoes that sadly tore many communities apart that evening. Computer models first indicated a potential severe weather threat a week to 10 days in advance. An upper level trough was expected to dig into the Rockies by the morning of the 31st inducing strong upper-level winds from the southwest over much of the Great Plains and Midwest. An existing surface low was expected to deepen, bringing moist gulf air northward. The atmosphere seemed favorable for severe weather, but it was too far out to discern any noticeable details. Still, the Storm Prediction Center released a Day 6 outlook highlighting the potential for severe storms centered around the Ozarks. It was a waiting game, as models would hone in on whether this threat would materialize or die out in the coming days. By the 29th, signals were increasing for a widespread tornado outbreak. Medium range models like the GFS, as well as mesoscale computer models like the NAM, we're starting to consolidate two areas of intense, severe weather risk in the lower Midwest and South. Each had strong tornado potential as indicated by moist mid-level air and strong low-level shear. The SPC noted this bimodal severe threat in their Day 3 outlook, highlighting all hazards, including hail and damaging winds on top of tornadoes. A large Day 3 enhanced risk would evolve into a double moderate risk a 4 out of 5 on the Storm Prediction Center scale the next day. On the morning of the 31st, the two moderate risk zones were combined into one zone spanning 8 states, and at around 11.30 a.m. Central on the 31st, the SPC pulled the trigger for a double high risk, the highest on the SPC scale for their Day 1 forecast. In their high risk of severe thunderstorms, they cited a significant likelihood of long-tracking violent tornadoes. Intense wind and hail was also expected. This computer model sounding of the outbreak sums it all up perfectly. The hodograph on the upper right shows wind shear varying with altitude. Shear is necessary for thunderstorms to exhibit rotation when they updraft air and is a primary ingredient in tornado formation. The elongated shape of the hodograph curving towards the right indicates a low-level jet of strong southerly winds curving towards the east with height. This allows updrafts to rotate counterclockwise and become tornadic. Additionally, CAPE values were in excess of 2,000 joules per kilogram. CAPE is a measurement of instability under the cloud base for storms to tap into and rapidly strengthen. For a late March severe threat, the Cape values were fairly high and had the potential to initiate copious amounts of violent tornadoes. This quantity is also related to the lapse rate, a measure of temperature change with height. Lapse rates of over 7 degrees Celsius per kilometer in some layers of the atmosphere, levels seen in some of the most historic tornado outbreaks, further indicated large amounts of instability. At around 2.18 local time, a radar indicated tornado touched down a mere 11 miles west of downtown Little Rock. With favorable environmental conditions, the tornado strengthened considerably as it moved east-northeast into the Calais Forest Department. Low-end EF3 damage was reported from these well-built structures as exterior walls had completely collapsed from many of the buildings. Many trees were also completely uprooted. The tornado continued into the north of east direction, weakening slightly but still causing EF2 damage in the Breckenridge neighborhood. Suddenly, the tornado rapidly strengthened to maximum EF3 status, completely flattening two neighboring two-story houses. 
After peaking, the tornado once again featured fluctuations in intensity, dipping down sharply to EF1 intensity before regaining intensity to high in EF2 status near Kamek Village. At this time, the NWS declared a tornado emergency for North Little Rock, the first Tori of the outbreak. Once the twister crossed the Arkansas River, it was clear that the Little Rock National Weather Service office was in the crosshairs. The staff took shelter, relaying operations to nearby NWS Memphis for the time being. The tornado also passed extremely close to the radar, revealing this amazing shot of an extremely tight circulation passing through the dead zone of the radar. The tornado continued to the northeast towards the Little Rock Air Force Base. Fortunately, a slight eastward shift in track occurred before the twister reached the base, but the storm also re-strengthened to weak EF3 intensity as it leveled a nearby church. As the parent thunderstorm slowly weakened, EF1 damage was reported eastwards in Parnell before the tornado dissipated just before 3 p.m. Central. The tornado, a third of a mile wide at peak, sadly killed one and injured over 50 more. In southeastern Iowa, a tornado touched down in rural land northeast of Ottumwa. This tornado eventually reached EF3 intensity before dissipating southwest of Kyoto. However, the potent parent supercell spawned another tornado in a similar location at around 4.12 p.m., as shown on this radar image with two separate areas of rotation. You can see this from the ground from an amazing shot by storm chaser Devin Pitts featuring the decaying initial tornado and the wider, stronger Kyoto storm. The tornado tracked northeast, intensifying quickly as it tracked through the western areas of town. Low-end EF4 damage, the highest of the entire outbreak, was evidenced by a house completely wiped off its foundation near Kyoto. As the storm continued northeast towards Wellman, significant damage continued, including the destruction of a 320-foot cell tower. Fortunately, nobody was killed, but three were injured. While the Kyoto tornado was wreaking havoc in Iowa, a new circulation touched down west-southwest of Wynn, Arkansas, a town of almost 10,000 residents. The tornado tracked directly through town with medium EF3 damage towards the west and center of town, as a convenience store and a number of houses were leveled. Additionally, Wynn High School received extensive structural damage to its exterior and athletic fields, further warranting the intensity. At its peak, the storm was a third of a mile wide and was captured by many storm chasers. As the tornado passed through the city, it turned more towards the east-northeast, impacting rural farmland and a couple of structures at low EF2 intensity. A tornado emergency for the Parkin and Earl communities east of Wynn was issued at this time. This Tori was the second of the outbreak. More rural damage, some reaching EF3 intensity as indicated by copious tree debarkment, occurred as the tornado danced across the Arkansas-Tennessee border. And after over 80 minutes on the ground, one of the longest tracked of the outbreak, the tornado finally lifted in Tennessee, 10 miles from the state border. Over the tornado's track, the storm sadly killed four, all in win and injured 26 others. On the northern end of the high risk, a wind tornado had dissipated. However, the parent supercell recycled, meaning that a new circulation that eventually extended to the surface was created. After touching down just before 6, around 25 miles northeast of Memphis, Tennessee, the nascent tornado rapidly intensified as it tracked along US-51 towards Brighton, a community of 3,000. EF3 damage was reported in West Brighton, where one house had nothing save for a few interior walls standing. The intensity continued at strong EF2 to EF3 intensity as it tore across Brighton and small communities along US-51. NWS Memphis issued a tornado emergency, the third of the day, as the storm approached Covington, a community of 10,000 strong. The tornado turned slightly east, striking the southern part of town. Dozens of homes were severely damaged, including one home that was completely swept away save for its foundation. A few factories were destroyed, requiring the layoffs of over 200 employees. Also, the town's middle and elementary schools experienced severe damages, requiring the temporary closure of both for the time being. Finally, the tornado exited the city, continuing to maintain EF3 intensity with peak winds of around 150 miles an hour. 
exhibiting a funnel almost one mile wide. The tornado eventually started a weakening trend before dissipating over open fields in Haywood County. The storm caused death in Covington and at least 28 injuries. The most severe tornadoes in the northern high-risk area occurred during or after sunset, since dew points were still climbing into the 60s in the beginning hours of the outbreak. Just before 9 p.m., a tornado touched down in rural eastern Illinois, the heart of the northern moderate zone. The storm moved east-northeastward with the low-level flow, intensifying quickly to a low-end EF2. Several people were trapped in basements due to the storm and had to be rescued. Further down its path, the tornado approached southern Robinson, prompting the issuance of a tornado emergency, the fourth of the day. Many mobile homes were overturned, killing two, and the tornado intensified to EF3 strength, destroying well-built corporation buildings on the eastern side of town. Um, we've, we've had emergency crews digging people out of their basements. The tornado moved directly through Robinson Municipal Airport, severely damaging many aircraft. One such plane, which had been in service for over 40 years, was irrevocably crippled. Continuing east-northeast, the tornado moved through southern Sullivan, Indiana. Poorly anchored homes were flattened and a 40,000 pound modular home was reportedly thrown over 200 yards, killing two. Some of the worst damage was recorded on the southeast of the city, where large vehicles and homes were completely destroyed and tossed. Across the whole tornado's 41-mile track, at least six people unfortunately died. The deadliest and one of the longest-lasting tornadoes of the outbreak touched down west-southwest of Bethel Springs, Tennessee, just after 11 p.m. Central. It quickly strengthened to EF2 intensity, obliterating a house and killing all four people inside. The storm then tracked into southern Bethel Springs, a community that had just been hit by a different EF2 two hours prior. An entire metal building and nearby utility poles were destroyed. Twelve miles to the east, northern Adamsville was hit hard. EF3 damage was present in some homes that had only interior walls left standing. A paper check from Adamsville was reportedly found 122 miles away in Franklin, an incredible proof of the tornado's power. After clearing Adamsville, the storm continued to wreak havoc across smaller communities in southwest Tennessee. Tim Tucker's mobile home of 20 years is nothing more than a pile of wood alongside Highway 64 near Selmer. He was on his couch when the tornado hit. I'm one of the lucky ones that survived. I mean, thank God I'm here. The tornado was over three quarters of a mile wide during this time, lofting debris miles into the air as indicated by radar. Finally, after staying on the ground for over 90 minutes, the tornado lifted near Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, but not before staying on the ground for 86 miles. The tornado caused nine fatalities and over 20 injuries. On top of the EF4 and multiple EF3s on the night of the 31st, other significant tornadoes occurred across the region that destroyed buildings, claimed lives, and flipped communities upside down. In Belvedere, Illinois, a long-tracked EF-1 inflicted considerable damage on the Apollo Theater during a heavy metal concert attended by over 250 people. The entire roof collapsed, killing one and injuring 48 others. The outbreak continued into the night of April 1st, as indicated by the Alabama-Tennessee border EF-3 which was on the ground for 16 minutes just after 3 a.m. local time. While the cooler temperatures of the night had lowered cape levels, thunderstorm initiation, wind shear, and moist dew points were still in place for thunderstorms to turn tornadic, especially in the south. As a result, around 40% of the recorded tornadoes occurred after 9 p.m. The CF3 unfortunately killed one, destroying houses and a farm on its path. Another EF3 that touched down during the evening hours tore through Indiana's McCormick's Creek State Park, snapping many trees and killing two campers. This tornado actually originated from the parent supercell of the Robinson tornado, highlighting the anomalously favorable conditions that span hundreds of miles across the Midwest.
Overall, the Storm Prediction Center, as well as the various NWS forecasting offices across the Midwest and South, did a terrific job at forecasting the storms. The bimodal storm setup indeed panned out, with two primary clusters in the Upper South and Midwest. Additionally, the SPC confidently extended the moderate and enhanced zone significantly further east, a decision that would soon be warranted by the extensive damages in Illinois and Indiana. Sometimes, human forecasting can even outperform computer models. One year after March 31st, many towns are back on their feet. Stories of success show that these communities are resilient to whatever terror Mother Nature throws at them. Even though the tornadoes brought almost $5.5 billion in damages, recovery efforts are going strong. Unfortunately, the 26 lives lost on that fateful evening can never be recovered, and the countless stories of fear and heartbreak may never be erased. But we can always try to move on.